I've got my plastic bag with uh, um, a wellies in. You, you can also tell me how to record. Oh, and and I, I've kind of put it on setting. It might be worth... Uh, yeah, I forgot my muff. Mm -hmm. I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got a, 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 a wind muff actually. <laughs> wow. Maybe two. Oh my god! Yes. Well, it depends how many rocks pops we get. Um, we feel yes. I think it's safe to say a little bit outside of our comfort zone, uh, but whatever. It's going to be a great day. We've, we've uh, heard from a few people on the team, and it looks like they've pulled together a really interesting program of stuff. So yeah. Off we go really to exciting. Beer Regis. Here we go, and it's a lovely sunny day. It is. Beer Regis is a tiny, tiny little village. I've never been there actually, so I don't know. I mean, and oh, yeah, and the most of the festival is taking place in a rewilding area, so there's a big focus on sustainability, from what I understand. Wild Woodbury. Wild called, Woodbury. Yeah. This is a good start. I have to make a U-turn here because I've forgotten that there isn't a way out at the end of this road. Oh yes, there is not. You can just go left here. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. I've got some walking boots which I might throw on. It is an absolutely beautiful day here. I'm living my best, my best journalistic life. It's sunny. I forgot my sunglasses, and there's like tents set up. There's a lot of cars. Portaloos. Portaloos. Civilization. Mm-hmm. It's lovely. Okay. Can we can we get some? Oh. So my name is Amy Groves and I'm Access and Front of House Supervisor for Inside Out Dorset. We have this event once every two years. Um, we specialise in extraordinary events in extraordinary places. Nice. Um, so we really enjoy taking art, making it as accessible, different, unique. It's always free and we encourage all ages um, and all every, um, range of people. Um, we have activities and this year we've been in more Valley, Pool, Wimborne, and Bear Regis and Weymouth. Okay, so now we're in the middle of a field and we're approaching some people who are standing around. <laughs> Good. Good. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And so I'm sat here with Laura Reed. Right. Uh, and we're here in the morning at just. Um, when everything's setting up and it's great to chat to you Laura thank you so much thank you. could you tell us a little bit about Songs of Hope then so Songs of Hope is a traditional kind of song cycle but it's in the landscape so I've used Echoes XYZ which is like an app mm -hmm. where I've uploaded all my tracks that I've recorded and I've set them in the landscape at Wild Woodbury here I did it at Tete -a, -tete a a couple of weeks ago and it went well but that was an urban environment here it's set in you know the rewilding project so some of the tracks are placed in places where it has relevance so mm -hmm. the first track is called hope and it's the emily dickinson poem about hope um which is quite obvious hopefully <laughs> <laughs> but the second one's called sustenance and Oge neroso who's one of the librettists she's writing really about the sort of climate change awareness of of migration and refugees and, and it's about sustenance having enough money and food to live so mm -hmm. that's in the sort of food area <laughs> right oh my god it's really on and point then, well it's kind of because it, it's sustainable you know yeah. they're trying to regrow all the food here and trying to let people know it's not just about rewilding it's about mm. the wider context of that and yeah. the complicated themes then the next one's a bit lighter and that is 
by Teresa Howard. That's Sacred Threads, and that's about these um, creatures, sea creature fossils that live off the coast here and that have been around for millia, millennia. <laughs> and it's kind of like saying, despite what we're doing to the planet, yeah. they will always be there. So it's kind of singing from their perspective. Something to take, something to take more hope from, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and then another one is called In the Forest Next to the Trees, which is about death. But like from a nature perspective, <laughs> they're all linked to death because my sister died in the pandemic. I see, right. And that's when I met Gwen, and, who's the opera singer, and Alison Devonish, and they helped me craft something mm. from all that grief. <laughs> so you came together, how did you meet, you came together via Engender? Is, yeah, and that, Gen- was a, that rings a bell, that was a project. Engender's a network that the Royal Opera House started a couple of years ago. And it's for female identifying people. It's yeah. not just, you know, women, but it's... It's to sort of encourage people. I mean, I love opera. I went to see, you know, Benjamin Britten when I was a kid, but I'm not in the opera scene. So it's mm-hmm. to encourage people. I'm a composer. Yeah. Um, to, to, to get the confidence to write in that thing, in that sort of repertoire, as it were. So that, so that, um, that group brought you together, you yeah. and plus the, the singer, plus and a couple of librettists, did you say? I met a few librettists. Are you going to go? So Teresa Howards and Katie Columbus through that. And then I had Al Hamwe's my my so she's local, um, but I met her through a local seeking refuge charity. So she's um a translator. Amazing. But and I people who bring hope, you know. Yeah. And then how did you come to be at Inside Out? How did they find Uh, you or did you find them? um, I've worked with Inside Out for a couple of years with Gobbledygook Theatre. Mm -hmm. I've worked on soundscapes for Lorna Reese's projects and I played with Jane Pitt a couple of years ago as well. So I'm, and I went on one of their courses as well, trying to get art into landscapes because it's hard translating it. Mm. So this is a bit of an R&D popping my sound walk in this field, you know. Oh, so life is a living R&D. <laughs> <laughs> if it's so not changeable, true. then it's fine. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Alice Stevens, um, and I'm a senior lecturer at Arts University Bournemouth in graphic design, but I'm also doing my PhD um, at Plymouth University. And as part of that, I'm exploring how we can connect people to embrace, uh, embrace the weather world. And um, Alice Sorry. has kind of called them enchanted items before because they don't really require Wi-Fi or anything, they just kind of happen and ideally work. So, cool. yes. Enchanted objects. Enchanted yeah. objects. So, how, how do they work? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Apart yes. from enchantment. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so they're, they're research artefacts is how we see them. Uh-huh. Um, so they um, contain a, a bit like a barometer, but it's an atmospheric, um, atmospheric barometric pressure sensor. Wow. So they sense, sense the different weather conditions. And when they sense those weather conditions, they select from a bank of poetry. um, And the poetry has been written specifically for this site. So through my walks with um, Dorset Wildlife Trust, um, I've actually used AI to develop the poetry. And then I've given those poems to real poets, such as Ben, who's a graduate from Arts University Bournemouth in creative writing. um, And also Zakia McKenzie, um, who's a poet who's worked quite a lot with um, Inside Out Dorset. Um, and as I said, written specifically for this site. And they sense these different weather conditions and they sing specific poems to you, um, specifically to try and kind of connect you to the weather world, to embrace all types of weather for more sustainable behavior. Fantastic. And so so these are just uh, for the people listening, they are very yellow, bright (laughs) wellies with a little um, speaker coming out out of one side. Yes. Absolutely. Can we get a blast of what is it? You can. Well, so, do, is um, it, do they come on randomly or how? So what they do is uh, we turn them on, we turn them off, um, they find their category and then about every five minutes they sing a poem to you. So I can okay. hear a pair going oh. now from somewhere. Oh, oh. here we go. <laughs> this is the beginning. Oh, oh it's down here somewhere. That's over there. <laughs> the land here is Literally stressed. enchanted because you never know. It's air, <laughs> pure and flowing. <laughs> The grass like rippling silk, unsettled by the breeze. A new feeling is growing. The wild landscape takes flight. Wild woodbury is more than it seems. Watch the sky and the clouds, frameless, unbounded as we walk. A skylark's call floats in the bust. 
people are loving them, absolutely loving them, and we're getting some really great insights from talking to people about how they're finding them, how it's actually helped them slow down, mm. how it's helped them appreciate nature. So they're doing their job, you know, that's what we intended for them to do. Um, and people, you know, so we've already had a, a, an, an offer to go to Ireland uh, to a circus science place to take them somewhere in Coventry. So we'll just, we'll just have to see. So I did the research for this work in um, West Bengal in India and in a, on an island called Sagar which is in the, not quite in the Sundarbans which is the Sundarbans is seeing and will continue to see some of the largest number of people migrating because their landscape is literally non-existent. So in Sag on the island itself and it's a really auspicious island for Indians because it's where the Ganges goes into the sea. So literally once a year, thousands and thousands of people descend upon this island just to kind of be there during a particular uh, prayers and stuff. So I went to that island because I had a connection through another artist who'd done some workshops with young people. So the whole process was actually going to schools and working with young people and doing sort of dance workshops with them. So I was bringing things with me. I, didn't, I don't speak Bengali. I, I don't even speak the language. But at the school, every single school we went to had a massive flood shelter. And the one that we had went to, they kind of the flood shelter went up a couple of stories, and on the top floor was where apparently the police would bring any people that they were holding in their cells up there. And the kids, you know, it was a kind of a real, it was real. You know, the kids wanted to show me where they went when there was a flood and there was a, a risk of anything happening. And the families, the children would all go into the school, and we were there, just sat there doing these workshops. And a lot of the movements we did with the young people were born out of their experiences. But the single most, um, the one single emotion that came out every time was hopeful. They were all hopeful. Because as far as they were concerned, there were, there were ways to stop their land eroding. And a lot of them came from fishing. You know, their parents were fishermen um, and they lived right by the water. And every time there was a massive big cyclone, their house would get washed away. They would move. And they would just literally pick up and move. And two kids I spoke to have lost their houses twice. And that was, but they were still very hopeful about the fact that they'll be away. And a lot of the cultural stuff sort of fed through that. It's almost as if this is nature, this is what's happening, and this is how we cope with it, is we get up and we move. And that kind of act of getting up and moving was really a lot about this work, and I wanted people to actually get up and move and move things and be part of that. And as you saw, yeah, and that's, Culturally, it, that was a thing that stuck with me. And then I spoke to a lot of people who'd moved because some of the, the islands on Saga are now underwater. So they moved to this, this uh, on the Sundarbans, they moved to this big island. And a lot of their structures that they built felt very um, permanent, yet not. And I don't know how to describe that. This idea that they were almost always ready to move. And there were lots of bamboo structures and there was always a lot of water around them that they used to live. You know, and they, they, they were still fishing, they were still doing everything. So the structures were kind of partly a result of seeing all of that. A lot of people don't know where the Sundarbans are. A lot of people don't know this is where the biggest, the largest number of migrants are going to be. And it felt important for me to tell those stories here. And the reason it felt important is as well, I'm working with South Asian dance forms. And I'm talking about moving and dance moves and South Asian dance forms are from that part of the world. So for me, all of those connections meant um, meaningful as to why I made this work. You know, it was about the fact that we were using South Asian dance forms, telling stories from that part of the world, and moving, and movement felt really important. So, um, yeah, and it's stories I really wanted to, even if people just go away with hearing the word Sundarbans, and there's a, so it's about, for me, not educating or anything, it's about instilling a curiosity 
that's all I, I, I really want is to instill that curiosity to keep, for people to go and, you know, I always say if you don't pick up an article about the Sundarbans, you might actually read it, as opposed to not read it because you've watched something and there's a, there's a, a relevance or a connection. And that's really what I was trying, you know, I'm trying to do with this work, is just say that it might not be on our doorsteps, but it affects us because the migration is happening, it's going, people are moving up north. You know, populations are decreasing up north. People are moving up north. It's not a, it's not a problem somewhere else. It, it affects all of us in some way at some point. And that, I think, felt really important to talk about. Protected landscape, so the organisation is an environmental based organisation uh, and a partnership of lots of other organisations that have an interest in this place. So, uh, environmentalists, landowners, farmers, um, the conservation sector, um, and the heritage sector as well. And you guys, you guys are, are, are looking after wild or in charge of the rewilding here? What's no, the, we, no, we work quite closely with the Dorset Wildlife Trust, who mm. do all of that, okay. um, and we we're a supporter of theirs, and they, they're an important part of the various partnerships that we pull together. But we're we're just outside the protected landscape here, so mm. the, the partnership with them is really useful. The site is really is an excellent place for this event to happen. So you have those conversations about environmental issues or opportunities and our relationship to, to nature um, so that's that's why we're here for the festival um, and we're a festival partner for this site as well so we've you know supported this happening here mm -hmm. how did that relationship come about then between inside out and outstanding natural beauty so it's quite an old relationship now it's probably I, well, I can't remember how long Inside Out's been going, but maybe 15 years ago was our first um, first bit of sponsorship for an event, really. Uh, and it was, a, it was an amazing event of um, music that had been brought together with s schools in the local community being performed on Hambledon Hill, Big Hill Fort, at dusk uh, on the Equinox night. And it had this, you know, big misty, windy, autumnal feeling about it, and yeah, very uh, esoteric, evocative type music um, and theatre and dance performance in that, uh, which was amazing. So that was the that was the first engagement we had really, uh, and since then we've been working with Activate a lot to just uh, explore that connection with place, connection with environment, uh, relationship with place. This is underpinning or the reason behind that being that if if we can help people love the place then maybe we can help people change the way it's looked after and for a better future. How do you see it so in terms of the arts then how do you see that, that I mean I guess you you see a lot of different projects as well working with you. Do you find um, how do you see that it changes people's perception I suppose of what they see around them? Well uh, a lot of people in this conservation line of work have come from a sort of technical scientific background and often with a with a broad audience and it, you start talking from that technical scientific point and you've lost 60 70 percent of them straight away um, and it's it's not in, it's not a way to engage people you know it's, it's a way of developing interest in the already interested but not really a way of getting people to stop and think and um, that's where working with artists to create those spaces and create those opportunities to to think about where we are and the way we live and all those kind of things. It's important. It's, it's actually something that we thought about. We were chatting with um, Alice, wasn't it, from Walking Wellies, mm. which is a really yeah. lovely thing. Is suddenly your boot, uh, <laughs> because of a handy little piece of kit, starts playing a poem. Yeah. And the one that we listened to actually was almost like a mindfulness exercise, you know, to stop, breathe, mm. look, listen. It was, it was sort of based around that kind of thing. And there's quite a... A direct kind of like you live in this space and we grew up you know just down in, down mm. in the doorstep 
I don't think I've ever been here though, but this is a very familiar kind of setting. But actually then to put, to place art and artworks mm. and artists and that sort of stuff into it, you do suddenly get a kind of different, you know, you just sort of stop and look and think, yeah. oh, this is beautiful and worth fighting for and worth keeping. So Alice particularly has been picking up that kind of feedback from people when they're returning the wellies of, you know, having experienced the place differently, even though they might know it quite well. Mm. Yeah. Hello, I'm Caroline. Hello, my name is Jonathan, and here is Becky. Hi, I'll be translating from spoken English to sign language. Uh, we are uh, an artistic duo, we are called Dos and Dos. It means uh, from flesh and bones. And as you can hear, uh, we are French, so we apologize for our English, and uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, hope that you will understand what we are saying. If you have any um, if, if there is any word that you don't understand, please feel free to ask. Uh, and if you have questions, we propose you to wait for the end of what we have to say together. We don't have any around here but places that haven't been ancient woodlands. You know ancient woodlands were like... There's no... So intervention. There is no intervention. It's just that's how it's it's this. There's no sort of intervention. There is no intervention. It's just that's how it is. There's no fun. There is no little. I've been to places where people aren't going to be, and it's weird seeing no little or anything. It's just around here, it's just a lot of fields There is a lot of fields and it's just all private and there's nothing there It's all private and there's nothing there It's not, it's, I don't think it looks beautiful I don't think it looks beautiful And it'd be good if it was just born Cause I love going up on a hill It's like, yeah I've just, I've always, always done it my whole life And it's just having, having more of that is I'd like to have that oh. Well, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. We've, I'm knackered, we did a lot. What time did we arrive? At 11 o'clock and here we are at 5.30. Having seen everything from uh, talking Wellington boots to a wonderful dance piece about climate migration to uh, singing about about the local habitat and what the rewilding area is. Absolutely, learning a lot about rewilding. Yeah, yeah. Doing a little bit of foraging at the end and drinking some lovely nettle tea. Exactly, and and talking about. The, the area and nature and autumn as well. Absolutely, yeah. I feel, I feel myself rewilded actually a little bit. Um, sunburned. I feel sunburned. <laughs> no, but I feel I feel that the the whole day for me was about connecting us to to nature and specifically that specific wild, rewilded rewilding spot through the arts. Yes, and I guess that's their sort of tagline, isn't it? So mm. they've done very much what they set out to do. I think it was a wonderful, wonderfully curated day, really well programmed, quite relaxed though. There were quite a few things that kind of, uh, they took the time. If the audience was late coming from one thing, then they just held on. The, um, one of my favourite things as well was the uh, Dutch-influenced uh, Songs for the Soil, which... Uh, had verbatim text set to music, um, and we sat on radiators that had been plumbed in and were being plumbed or fed or whatever you'd call it by hot water from a from a kind of burning altar at one end of the at one end of the space, and everyone had warm bottoms while they were listening to this uh, verbatim poetry. It was very cool. And I, I think I ke I went into this day thinking I would have questions about I guess logistics about setting up an outdoor theatre festival or, or not setting up doing an outdoor and what that means and what that means for an artist and like mm. dealing with different weather and terrains and unknown, and lots of unknowns like that but I think what I came out with was more a sense of what what is the point 
points from in <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> but what is the point in a in a very local rural outdoor theatre festival? Like, what what can you bring uh, that, for example, people can't get by watching Netflix, for example? Yeah. And I, th- I think that they 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 really managed to 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 do that both on the sense of connecting people to the local area and also by bringing in these international artists so you're, you're having this wider perspective but all on a very local place and topic which mm. I thought that so that that, that com- combination actually works very well and plus the fact that it's all outdoors and all in this in this beautiful environment really makes you f- like appreciate that environment much more exactly and you hear that a lot don't you you speak to any artist doing stuff that's site specific certainly if it's nature based and they'll often come up with 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 words like connect connection uh, re uh, reviewing or repicturing a space reframing it uh, seeing it in different light that sort of stuff and of course it's it's very easy to switch off that we've talked a lot about um jargon and, and it's certainly in the arts you know jar- it's certainly in the arts when it's crossed with, with uh, the corporate uh, sort of side of things uh, lots of jargon lots of words which which do mean something but you just have to unpack them usually and of course what does that mean in this case and I think what we found out today is just the, it's literally the act of doing the act of experiencing within those spaces um, being taken on a foraging walk whilst hearing a story create you know being there whilst someone creates uh, a tea from the things that you forest directly uh, as as the culmination of that story um, being sat in uh, a kind of uh, almost homemade theater made out of wicker listening to someone's story watching a piece of artwork watching piece watching um, a story about climate migration from an area which I hadn't really I was aware of but I hadn't don't know anything about but I am now aware of, but watching it being performed in what still pretty much looks like a working farmyard in Dorset. Mm. I mean, it's, that, that is it. That is, in inverted commas, connection. That is making connection. There it is. There it is. There it is. Anything else to add? I don't think there's anything else to add. Already. I don't know. Well, I think... Is there anything you can take from it in your in your life? Are you going, are you going to become a forager? <laughs> well, I mean, like I am certainly someone, like many people in our generation, who have been completely dissociated from nature, and I think it's so important that we do go back to nature and go back to knowing about where where our food comes from and what is what what parts of nature we can use in a symbolic way uh, um, and, and yeah and you know well I, I mean like we've been brought up on vitamin pills etc and like that actually you can, you, you can get that from me from what's on your doorstep and just knowing a few little things about the plants for example but it's, it's not just that but it's, it's and, and it's about knowing you know how how dense we, for, for years and years humans have just been extracting from from the land and I think and you know rewilding is obviously the process of, of, of reversing that and making these ecosystems a much more um, dense place they said today that 300 new species have come back in the last two years or something in this place yeah, yeah. yeah I mean it's just just incredible it's it, it's that is another wonderful word it's diversity is diversity of species so knowing all of those things that uh, the things that we've just foraged for example all of which appear, I mean, we know walking around the fields of Dorset, they, they appear in fields up and down the country, um, but I would never have known that you could pop most of them into boiling water and make a fairly tasty, pretty nutritious beverage from them, for example, and I think what we've, what we've done as humans, certainly over the last 50 years with supermarkets and whatnot, is we've actually, we've narrowed down our diet to a select handful of meats and proteins, a select handful of vegetables and and that sort of stuff um, and in reality a lot more of it is open to us a lot more of it can be used yet because we're sort of I mean I'm fully in the you know I'm fully in the in the modern mindset I need to be I need things to be quick and uh, quick and packaged sometimes and even pre-prepared and, and I know that's a sacrifice I'm making possibly to my health and that kind of stuff but 
it's also good to know that, um, that there are people out there willing to teach. Yeah, and I think that's it, it's education. Teach the full, yeah. teach the full bracket of what we can eat. And, and, and then it's about the, the place of arts and, and how, how arts can help us ourselves rewild, not just rewilding a place, but rewild ourselves and get us as humans back connected with nature where we've lost that connection. Yeah, and then and then of course there's, there's you look at the ways that that's been done today, the fact that the festival is there is is one thing, it's, uh, it, it's, it's funded, there is, there's a lot of work that's, and, and, and it was all very much based around those ideas of connection with nature and rewilding, um, you know, it, it's bringing people to the site. You can tell specific stories, um, but also, uh, as the artistic director of the dance piece said, that actually uh, she is simply making people aware of the name of the place about which the piece is made. It's she's so that the next time when you see an article about that, about the rewilding of the countryside, about um, the destruction of rainforest, about the fact that there are refugees having to move because of climate change and things like that, that you might read it and have a connection with it. Oh, that's the, that's to do with the dance piece that I watched at this piece. That's to do with that piece of theatre that I saw, um, which is which is powerful. Yeah, and I think then that if we then reflect that to the bridge theatre, I think that that's in. Yeah, I think we both took away from that. Re- we we both thought that was a really poignant thing to say, and I think that for me then it's it's, it's about creating theatre. You know, we, we want to create theatre that, that raises a point or has a, a raises a specific thematic uh, and, and, ha- and raises a discussion. I mean, I think I used to think that uh, I wanted theatre to, to set a specific agenda, which I do, but I think that you don't need to be so didactic in, what you, in, in the message you're, 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 you're bringing, rather just raise the general theme so that people are aware of it or that people can have that discussion. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, we had some good thoughts. And lots I think, of words. L- lots of words. <laughs> and I think it's very, yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's so n- <clears throat> nice that in deepest, darkest rural doors that you have this theatre <laughs> festival, which is, uh, with, of, with inter- again, within the internationality is really important, I think, about uh, mixing, connecting, and, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. okay. So, so this has been delightful. As, as always. As, as always. And uh, lovely to reconnect in our home county. Yeah, hometown. and in the car, in your car, in, in your car. car. Um, I suppose it's business as normal next month and we have a guest lined up ah, that sort of stuff. we do and I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute but to all, all our listeners out there see you next month bye bye